Welcome to the Rick Fuller Podcast, presented by Rick Fuller, team leader of the number one real estate team in the San Francisco Bay Area and Sac County for most recent sales, according to Zillow. Rick is a national real estate coach, financial expert, and successful real estate investor. I'm Christina Morales, a writer and marketer, and Rick and I started these conversations because I felt stuck in my financial situation and I needed help. So I thought, if I need help, hey, let's invite everybody along for the ride. Uh, what I was doing wasn't working, and I needed direction. So thanks, Rick, for joining me on these podcasts. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for facilitating them, Christina. Of course. So today's topic is a financial guide to start real estate investing. And we have an incredible guest with us today. Danielle Pollock has worked in the financial services industry for over 25 years. And she's worked for a number of industry leaders, including City and Wells Fargo. She is currently a regional manager for Supreme Lending, heading up the Bay Area, as well as she does loans for herself. Welcome, Danielle. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Thank you so much, Christina. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you again, Rick, for having me along. Of course. Excited to, to have a conversation with you about real estate investing. Because yes. it really, Christina, Danielle, this is a topic... There is so much misinformation, miscommunication, late night infomercials, CDs, books, downloads that you can buy, and people aren't actually doing it. What we're going to be sharing with you is how people are actually investing in real estate and to be able to share authentically, genuinely. And, you know, Danielle, you and I both have experiences of investing in real estate personally. And you know, Christina, you and I looked and we had in, we've served a thousand real estate investors. We've helped a thousand of them buy a home or invest in real estate. And I'm going to be able to share with you through these podcasts, like how it's actually happened. Not what the theory is, not a good idea, not a strategy, but what people are actually doing in the community in today's market. That's so good to hear because it is busy and crazy out there. So we need direction and we need to know someone who we can trust to help us make this because it's a huge investment. And so we need to know um, all the facts. So thank you so much for both of you for taking the time today. So Rick, you've been in the real estate industry for over 15 years. And in that time, you've undoubtedly realized the importance of a great mortgage lender. Can you tell me a little bit about how you met Danielle and how she's an important asset to the Rick Fuller team? Well, she absolutely is. And Danielle is really the leader of a group of team members that we get to work with. And honestly, they're just the best of the best. Supreme Lending is just awesome. Um, I'm not just saying that when I need a loan, when I need financing, I go to Danielle, her team, and Supreme Lending. I mean, I can't think of any greater endorsement than where I send my family, my friends, and where my wife and I go uh, when we need a mortgage or we need to refinance. Uh, there are, you know, there are one-stop shop for that. And what I love about Supreme, yes, they've got all the services and the products and they've got great interest rates and all that, but these are people that care deeply. And that's kind of our heartbeat. The heartbeat of our team is we want to provide people the kind of buying and selling experience they're excited to tell a friend about. So when you find a partner and they're like, that's what we believe in too, and you can do business together, um, it, it accomplishes that end goal. Mm -hmm. And Danielle, can you share a bit about your background? How did you become regional manager for Supreme Lending and what does your job entail? Uh, that's such a great question, Christina. Some days I'm the janitor. Um, <laughs> it it, it uh, encompasses a lot of things, right? But, um, you know, I think it was kind of written in the stars that I was going to um, fall into mortgage banking at a very young age, playing Monopoly with my family. <laughs> banker. So I was the girl lending money for people to buy and sell houses. So I think I kind of knew where my, uh, where my journey would take me. Um, but you know, I started in finance, I started as a teller when I was 15. Um, and I stayed with the big banks um, all through my college career. When I graduated, I went into management. Um, and then I went into the mortgage side. Um, in 2009, when the mortgage industry uh, and the real estate industry really took a um, city had uh, had made a decision that they wanted to um, slow down their mortgage production. Uh, so at that point, I actually went independent and started opening up my um, own offices. So 
Um, I have eight offices throughout the Bay Area now um, that I run and oversee. We have a team of about 60 people of originators and support staff. Um, so I really do it all. Um, like you said at the beginning, um, I originate myself. I absolutely love helping clients build wealth. Um, and so my job is to help my team and help clients uh, invest in this market. That's so good to know. Thank you. Uh, Rick, this podcast is for our Agents Thrive and our Investors Thrive groups. Can you share about why now is a great time to invest in real estate? Well, absolutely, Christina. Um, it, it is a great time to invest in real estate. You know, if you think about it, if we really simplified it, there are three markets. Uh, there's a market that's going up and down regularly, and that has some hesitation and a lot of uncertainty. Is it going up? Is it going down? And investors, whether it's the stock market or the real estate market or any other market, they're hesitant when there's uncertainty. You probably have heard that. There's consumer uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so a market that's going up and down has a lot of uncertainty. A market that is declining, home values are declining, sales are not occurring. That market is very concerning because if you're an investor, whether you're going to buy and hold or buy and flip, and we talk about how to do both on these podcasts, if you're an investor and you buy in the market and then it declines in value during the term of your ownership, that's not good. Right. And that is unhealthy. So look at the market we're in now. Sales are climbing. Price is climbing. The, the sales price is climbing. There are multiple offers in, in this market. And that makes it a great time to invest in real estate. And, you know, Christina, I have found that there are four kinds of real estate uh, enthusiasts. They're the first kind, and it's the biggest slice of the pie. And they're what I call real estate spectators. Now, they want to do it, uh, and they may have great reasons to do it, but they just never go out and buy a property. They never buy an investment. They never buy a, an Airbnb, a VRBO, a commercial, residential, in-state, out-of-state. They just don't do it. And uh, there could be a number of reasons. It could be an education thing. They can listen to our podcast and learn how to do it. Uh, but they become a real estate um, spectator and they're just watching what's happening in the market. And the most common phrase I hear from a real estate spectator that comes out of their mouth is, I wish I would have. Like, I wish I would have done it five years ago. I wish I was at seven, 10, whatever. Like, I wish I would have. Then you have a second kind of investor, and I call them the real estate speculator. And the real estate speculator, they are solely based on appreciation. If I buy today and the home value is going up, then it's going to be worth this tomorrow. But we all know that there's no guarantee that the market will continue to rise and continue to rise inevitably is is a fallacy or, or a misnomer or is just an assumption at best. So I call them real estate speculators because their entire basis is based on the speculation of rising home values. There's a third kind of investor, and I really like these people because I'm one of them, and they're the numbers people. Uh, these people are real estate investors, and you know they live by this saying, if you do the numbers, the numbers will tell you what to do. And they're real estate investors, and those people, they know what to buy it for, they know what to sell it for, they know how much to invest into it, they know how much it's gonna rent for, uh, they can tell what kind of uh, Airbnb, VRBO, what the costs associated with those things are for vacation rentals. They understand the numbers. I really like those people because I can speak really uh, well in that audience. And there's a fourth kind, and they're my favorite. <laughs> I love these people um, because as a, you know, kind of a child at heart, right? Just as a, as a young boy, I would collect Hot Wheels or maybe baseball cards. And the fourth kind of real estate enthusiast, they are real estate collectors. They collect an assortment of real estate. I mean, they, it's almost as if they were an eight-year-old boy or girl. And they're saying, here are my baseball cards I've been collecting. You know, here, here are my coin collection. Here's my Hot Wheels collection. And they do that in an intelligent way with real estate and it creates diversity. It, it, it moves the things around so not all the eggs are in one basket. It gives them a well, a depth understanding of real estate and they are beyond a spectator. They're beyond a speculator. They think even deeper than the investor 
and they own a collection of real estate and it becomes their portfolio. And in a market that has been where home values are climbing, where there's multiple offers, uh, where there is consistency, where there is credibility in the real estate market, it's a great time to be an investor or a real estate collector. Well, I've learned two things thus far. One, not to play Monopoly with either of you. <laughs> and two, I'm not a numbers person. I'm a number one, what you said, where I like to look and watch, but I'm scared. So I'm glad I have both of you on my team so that I can build wealth. Uh, so Danielle, I know you've been super swamped busy because mortgage rates have been at a crazy all-time low. What determines yes. the mortgage rate and what does this mean for real estate investors? That's, a, that's an incredible question that you ask. So mortgage rates are really, um, they're risk-based. So what, what a lender looks at is their total risk and that defines your rate. So that's made up of a couple things. That's made up of your FICO score. So how um, in our industry, past performance is indicative of future performance. So we're gonna look at your credit score and that's an indication of how you pay your bills. We're gonna look at the loan to value. Obviously a um, person who has more equity in their home is less of a risk um, from a walking away from the home or being uh, foreclosed on. Um, it's just a less risky proposition. Um, and then the third thing, believe it or not, is the type of property. So um, the type of property dictates your rates too. Uh, a lot of people don't know that a condo has a different pricing structure um, than a townhome or even a single family home. If you're buying a multi-unit property, that has a different price structure. So all of those things come into play uh, to basically figure out what your interest rate is. The lender, we're cash flow lenders. No lender ever is in the position where they want to kick you out of your house and own that property. All they want is a return on their investment. They want to know that they're going to lend you the money and you're going to continue to pay it for that 360 months if it's a 30 year fixed or 180 months if it's a 15 year fixed, et cetera. Uh, so that's really what they're looking at. So your interest rate really is a function um, of the overall risk. Um, yeah. That's great to know. I never knew that. So thank yes. you for sharing. Uh, Rick, a low mortgage rate means a lower monthly payment. In your opinion, should we use the extra funds for uh, home updates or should we go into a nicer neighborhood with a more expensive house or should we put those funds back in the bank and invest in another property? What's the best way to take advantage of this? Well, let's, let's look at that. So when you have low interest rates, um, most people say that means I've got a low monthly payment and that is very helpful. And maybe it helps the property, what we'd call cash flow. More income comes in than what's going out to maybe your mortgage company, maybe to property taxes, insurance, maintenance, repairs, property management, whatever. But when I think of low interest rates, the real value of low interest rates, it's not just the low monthly payment. It's the fact that every time you make a mortgage payment, more of that money is carved out to the principal balance and less of it goes to interest. Now, if you think about it, when I talked about the real estate speculator, they're speculating on rise of value and they want what we call equity. They want equity in their investment. But there's two ways to gain equity. One is the property goes up in value, but there's another way to gain equity in the property and that's to drive down the mortgage amount right? So when you have a low interest rate, which is the silver lining in today's market, I mean, it's like the, the icing on top of the cake. It's the cherry on top. The fact that we have these low interest rates because investors that buy a property, they buy it right, which we'll talk about how to do that by buying it right. And they pay down the mortgage every time they make a payment. The majority of it's going to principal with these low interest rates, driving down the home value, creating equity for the real estate uh, enthusiast. And that's what we want you to do. Now, what can you do with that additional money? Well, there's a lot of things you can do with those additional dollars that you're saving by not having the, the high mortgage that you would otherwise have in a high interest rate environment. One of my favorite is to apply a little extra towards the principal. And a lot of real estate investors don't think that. They just think, okay, I, I'm gonna suck the equity out of my house. Every single time I gain a dollar of equity, I'm gonna suck it. Why not create that and, and accelerate that 
is that if you have an extra 100, 200, 500, I, we, work, we coach people that they're spending thousands of dollars extra to pay down the principal balance of their mortgage. And you know what happens when I started doing this in my, oh, in my uh, early 30s, paying extra on the mortgage, when the mortgage would come in before I started putting extra money towards my principal balance, I didn't even want to look at it, the mortgage statement. You know, it was like, I'm just going to, okay, I want to look at the birthday card. I want to look at the, you know, the sales. I want to look at the magazine that came in, but my mortgage statement's going in the trash, going in the round file. Mm -hmm. When I started paying extra towards the principal balance on my mortgage, it was like the first piece of mail I wanted to open up. Because every time I opened it, I could just see my, my principal balance on my mortgage just crumbling. And it got to a point where I was so excited about it, I literally wanted to frame my mortgage statement in between my kids. April, autumn, mortgage statement, summer, right? Like I have three daughters, right? So I, it, it was just so awesome to look at how it was crumbling and I was gaining equity as a result of just putting a little bit of money. And for some people, like when I first started, I had little ones at home, 50 bucks a month was all I could do. For some people we, we were working with that they're doing thousands and thousands of dollars driving down the principal balance. And over the course of a year, not only did they create equity because home values have been rising, that's a reality, but they created even greater equity because they drove down their principal balance of their mortgage. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. And uh, Danielle, when people are looking for a mortgage lender, what should buyers and agents ask to ensure that they're getting the best deal and that they'll close in a timely manner, especially now when the market is so hot? And what are some common mistakes that they should avoid? So the first thing I, I think that you want to ask your lender is, are they doing a pre-qualification or are they doing a pre-approval? Those are two very, very, very different things. So a pre-qualification is when you um, walk into your lender and you say, I make X amount per year. And they run your credit score and they say, based on the information you provided me, congratulations, you're pre-qualified for this much. Now, where you run into a pitfall is that person may not be lying about their income. So for instance, let's say they make, I say I make $120,000 a year, but let's say that $30,000 of that is bonus income. Now let's assume that I haven't been on my job for, for two years or I don't have a history of bonus income. My lender may not be able to use that income. So based on the information that you just gave your banker and they gave you a pre-approval, you went out shopping and got in contract, you weren't lying. You do make $120,000 per year, but that doesn't mean that the bank is going to use all of that income. So that's a pre-qualification is you're just giving them information and they're just spitting out an approval, garbage in, garbage out, I call it. Um, the second is a pre-qualification, uh, or I'm sorry, a pre-approval, pardon me. And a pre-approval, um, we're doing the same thing. We're taking a loan application where you're running your credit, but we're actually collecting all of your income documents uh, and your asset documents. Um, so we're verifying your income. Um, oftentimes we're sending out verifications of employment. So we're ver verifying those bonus funds that we could use all that money. Um, we're verifying the assets are there. Um, again, not all assets, um, you know, are treated equally. So um, we're looking at that. Can you take from your 401k? Um, if you're getting into jumbo financing, do you have 12 months reserves? All of these things are important to know up front. So it does take a little bit more time. So clients, sometimes they want to get out and they want to get shopping. And I understand in this market, things don't last. Um, so you do have to move quick, um, but you have to go slow to move quick. So you really have to trust a lender to do a pre-approval because then when you get into contract, you have a, you're less likely to fall out of contract because you've already done your due diligence up front. So it's just such a smoother and easier process. Um, so that's the first thing, um, you know, that I, I would highly recommend. Um, I would also ask your lender how long they need to close. Um, and I can't tell you how important this is right now. Um, lenders are very busy, period. Um, for so many different reasons. We have low interest rates. Um, we have, you know, banks ha are dealing with um, forbearance and a lot of other servicing issues in the background. Um, so there's just,
just, there's a lot going on, uh, you know, with, with the mortgage lending um, period. So you want to ask your bank how long they realistically need to close that, that mortgage. When you get into contract, um, you have something that's called a good faith deposit, and you put that on the line when you get in a contract. So if you don't close on time, you potentially are putting that at risk. Um, I actually just um, had a client who came to me. They were v It's a VA uh, a loan. Um, zero down, very popular loan. Um, they went with an online lender. Um, they're going to take 60 days to close that purchase. In this market in Northern California, a 60-day purchase is going to be very hard uh, to put you in a position where you're going to land um, your dream house. It's just this is a very fast-moving market. So I think understanding how quick your lender can close and then writing the contract uh, around that um, is important. I mean, most of our deals that we're doing right now are a 21 to a 17 day or a 21 to a 27 day close. Um, we're trying to move through the process as quickly as possible. Um, so it is important to ask that um, up front before you put your deposit at risk. Um, and I think shopping rates is important. But I also don't think that it's the only component in getting a house. Um, a lot of people, again, use online lenders, and they're great in some cases, but in purchases, um, I, we've also had to come in and rescue a few. So just kind of understand the, the, you know, the bigger picture. I think that rate is a very important component, uh, but it should not be the only component. You should look at those other things too, time to close, et cetera. Um, and then the last recommendation that I ha would have is honestly in this market is using a local lender. Um, I think that um, California is very different than Ohio, which is very different than Texas. And so you need a lender that understands that market. Um, we do, we're in California. This is our market. Our underwriters are in California. They understand $2 million condos. They understand properties that have an in-law unit on the back. You know, those aren't foreign. Uh, those are just a part of California real estate. So those are things that we see usually lenders who don't or aren't as familiar as California, um, they can get a little bit wonky. So again, having a lender that has expertise in the local market, uh, I think is a, a huge benefit to somebody. Those are great tips. So many people don't know where to begin. They just know they want to buy a house. So, and then now, and they may lose the house because they, they're not prepared. So those are very applicable tips. Thank you. And so, Rick, what type of mortgage is best for a rental property? 15 or 30 years? And how much should you put down? I've heard anywhere between 2 to 50%. It's kind of like shooting in the dark. So can you advise us with that? You bet. And uh, before I do, I just want to make one comment on what Danielle was saying. Uh, Danielle is right. Um, there are two kinds of buyers. There's the willing buyer, and then there's the willing and able buyer. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are willing. Uh, but maybe not able because they haven't dotted the I's and crossed the T's and made sure that they were ready to do it. And so what we want to do is make sure that somebody who's interested in investing in real estate, um, in, uh, interested in purchasing their next property, they're both willing. Okay, that, That's their own motivation. They, they, that's right for them, their family. They want to move there. They want to transition for a bigger, smaller, different home, whatever. But we also want to make sure if they're willing, we can help make them able we can help in create that purchase power that they need so they don't get over their head. Uh, nothing's worse than being house poor, and turning the American dream into the American nightmare that every penny that you have is going to your mortgage. We're gonna make sure that doesn't happen. And we do that by operating within sound procedures and principles. So you ask, what's the best mortgage? Well, I'll tell you, I have a really strong personal preference on this and I've, to be, just transparent with you. I've tried them all. I've tried the adjustable rate, the pickup payment, the negative amortization, um, and most of them ended in just frustration, disappointment, discouragement. I didn't make any progress. Uh, today, I am a huge advocate uh, of the 15-year mortgage because when you actually run the numbers, you will find that a 15-year mortgage, especially at today's remarkably record interest rates, they're so low that a 15-year mortgage, first thing, what I mentioned earlier, every time you make a payment, more of it's going to the principal and less interest with a 15-year. So I can do that with a 30. Yes, you can, but it's, it's drafted or it's casted a different way with a 15-year mortgage, right? 
I love a 15-year mortgage. The other reason I like a 15-year mortgage is it seems like when I talk to people, I say, where were you going to be in 15 years? And they tell me, well, my kids will be in college or we're thinking about retirement in 15 years. Would it be helpful to have a house that's paid off free and clear? Would it be helpful to have a vacation home that you own free and clear? Would it be helpful to have that rental income that is coming to you rather than to the mortgage lender in 15 years? Would that be of value to you? And I have never, not once, heard somebody say, no, no, Rick, that's no value to me. I'd rather send it to the bank. <laughs> I'd rather wait for 30 years to pay it off. Almost everyone says, wow, that would be amazing. And it's not about 15 or 30, it, or it's about what that does for you in 15 years from now. Does that enable you to send your kids to the school that they want to go to because you now have that income? Uh, or does it help you fund a retirement plan that you have and dreams that you have because you don't have a mortgage payment on your own primary residence, right? All of that becomes possible with a 15-year mortgage. And the third thing I love about a 15-year mortgage that is just, um, it just creates the greatest opportunities is that a 15-year mortgage drives so much of that monthly payment to the principal balance that you end up seeing that payment, that mortgage balance just crumble over time. And you'll go like I did from hating the mortgage statement to wanting to frame it uh, as a result of having the right mortgage. And we can find properties that you can rent, whether it's a Airbnb or a VRBO or a vacation rental, both Danielle and I own those, uh, or investment properties where you could rent for a year or two years, multiple years as a, as a, have a tenant. Uh, commercial properties that these properties cash flow with a 15 year mortgage. Some are in state, some are out of state. Um, some we can help you with, some we find other professionals to help you with. And regardless, we can find properties where the numbers work. And like I mentioned earlier, if you do the numbers, the numbers will tell you what to do. And that's how a good real estate investor thinks they're a little less emotional then when you buy your primary residence, you buy the primary residence, you walk in and say, that's where I'm putting the Christmas tree. That's where the flat screen's going and our couch is going right there. But not so with an investment property. You think about it a little bit different. Maybe the emotions are a little, I don't want to say they're not there, but they're certainly toned down and you're thinking about it more as an investment rather than how you're going to live in the home. And that completely changes the way you view that investment property, how you purchase it, what you purchase, uh, what you upgrade in it, how you prepare it for the market. Everything changes based on when you change the lenses of looking at an investment property for really what it is. Biggest mistake investors make, they go and they buy an investment property because it's a home they want to live in, but they never live in it. And, and they wonder why it didn't work. Well, because it doesn't work that way. We need to look at it for with the purpose and intent that you're buying it. So that creates a clear lanes of what we do and what we don't do for that investment property. So um, Danielle, is there a different process between getting a, um, a loan for a primary residence versus an investment property? It's the same process, Christina, so we're going to pre-approve you. Um, it does get a little trickier if you are using rental income because we have to forecast what we think rental incomes are going to be on that property. So what we do is um, we have an appraiser. When they appraise the property, they actually um, give us market rents, and that's really um, – it's, it's very different market by market. So for instance, in cities like Oakland and San Francisco and Berkeley, you have rent control. So they necessarily use rent control. If there's a tenant in that property, they have to use current rents as opposed to market rents. Um, so if it's, you know, if you're out in the East Bay, well, parts of the East Bay, then uh, that isn't under market control. Um, then we can kind of use, you know, rental meter, Zillow, things like that to get some average rents. Um, but that could be a little bit, you know, tricky. But we do, um, we give a, um, an investor credit for 75% of the future uh, rents on the property to help them offset their 
mortgage. So we assume a vacancy factor. Um, we assume, you know, they're going to have expenses on the property, things like that. So if a property we're going to rent, um, you know, just for round numbers for $10,000 a month, we would give them credit towards the mortgage of $7,500 per month. So that's how uh, generally we qualify. So when we're doing a pre-approval pre for a single family home, we're just using their income. Um, when we're doing an investment property, we're using their income plus the projected rents uh, with a haircut on that, obviously, for the things that I mentioned uh, to help them qualify. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and Rick, Christina, yeah. And, you know, Christina, we did a podcast, you and I, some time ago, which is on our podcast feed, about what we call the triple eight. And if you listen to Danielle, they use 75%. Well, the triple eight means that you should assume that every property that you purchase has at least an 8% vacancy, an 8% for property manager if you're gonna use one, and 8% for maintenance. That water heater is gonna go out, the roof is going to leak. These things, uh, Rick, be positive. I am positive <laughs> that stuff's gonna happen. Uh, so we plan for it. So the same 75%, that your lender uses, we use when we actually look at an investment property, we start running the numbers. You know, if you do the math, you'll find that 8% is about one equivalent to one month's rent or equivalent to, you know, your maintenance is equivalent to one month's rent. Some properties require more, some properties require less, but I found that that triple eight um, goes right alongside of what your lender is giving you credit for, which is about 75% of the real income. Because the other 25, or I would even say 24%, is probably going to be allocated out to those AAA things. And now you, you've got a good investment property that helps you uh, accomplish what you set out to accomplish without uh, putting you underwater. Mm -hmm. So with an investment property, do you, do you determine how much you charge for rent based on your mortgage? Um, and how do you determine your budget versus the potential return on investment? How do you determine your rent? Well, you know, it's a great question, and a lot of people do it just how you described. How much do I want to get in rent? And that's the number they choose. Or what's my mortgage payment? Yeah. Or or what's what's my you know what's what's my dream? Or how much money do I need to live on? None of that is how you calculate rent. You calculate rent by finding out what another tenant was willing to pay in rent for a similar property. And we call it market rent. And we take that into consideration and use multiple properties and you look and say, well, these properties in this community, which they're never the same, they're always just a little bit different, but they're similar. Some have a bigger lot, some have a smaller lot, some have a bigger square footage, some are smaller. Some have a view, some don't have it. We take all that into consideration and we can see what generally tenants are willing to pay for, for market rent for that community. And that then becomes a reasonable basis to say, if you buy this property and you elect to rent it, then others in your neighborhood are generally collecting X number of dollars in rent, and you should be very close to that number. And we can also see, well, how long does it take to find a tenant? And what was the condition of that property? And what did they do to market and advertise that property for rent? Like, what did they do, and did that impact their ability to rent it? We can take all that into consideration and have a solid, sound, uh, assessment of what rental income should be. Then we reduce it by those triple eight, eight percent for property management, eight percent for vacancy, and eight percent for maintenance. And if you don't use a property manager, uh, which we're not a property manager, we don't do that, but if you don't use a property manager, then maybe it's only, you know, uh, 16 percent. It's the maintenance and the vacancy. And if you use a property manager, we generally see them about eight percent. So this allows you to be able to get the right rental amount. You're not over projecting. You're not going in with hopefulness or, or just anticipation that you're going to get a rent or presumptuous. You are going in with solid numbers so that you can make a decision. Remember, do the numbers and the numbers will tell you what to do. Well, and Rick, we talked about having three to six months of reserves as part of your four R's and the logs. So would that triple eight go into like your reserve account? Absolutely. But if you're going to own an investment property, you have a business, right? And so you don't, what we call commingle them. You don't mix it with your grocery budget, right? You don't mix it with your gas budget. And, you know, and you'll learn this your first year if you're new to investing. 
uh, your first year, most people just put it into their checking account. And, and then what happens is their accountant says, okay, uh, tell me how much did you spend on this rental property? And they got to remove their groceries. They got to remove their cable bill. They've got to remove, you know, their trips to the local restaurants or grocery store. And they've got to go through, create a separate account, separate bank account. Everything goes to that bank account. There's no commingling. You're, you're not mixing funds. It is clear. It is concise. And a separate bank account can be really, and, and that's where you want to put three to six months. But the three to six months in that case isn't, Christina, your income or your expenses. It's the expenses associated with that property. Okay. If I didn't have rental income for three months, how much is that? Okay, so that's my expenses associated. And you should have three to six months in that account. And based on the property, uh, based on the market, uh, based on what kind of rental income you're getting and how long it takes to rent, a three to six months is generally a really good number to fuel, fund that account, keep that money set aside. If you tap into it, replenish it when you get the, a new tenant back in place, you put a new roof on, you replenish it with the cash flow that you're receiving, and you keep that number healthy in your account and you'll have a better rental property experience. Always um, interesting to me, I'll, get, I'll be in a conversation like this and someone will say, I don't believe in rental property or I don't want rental property because I don't want to fix a toilet at two o'clock. I've never fixed a toilet at two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, I don't want to go there on a Saturday afternoon and fix a fallen fence. I've never gone there on a Saturday afternoon and fixed a fallen fence. Like there's ways to manage that, handle that support. And one of these that removes a lot of this pressure is by having a properly funded checking account for that property that is 100% for that home or the rental properties that you're managing within that grouping. They all come through, all incomes go through, all income goes through there, all expenses go out of there. It's really, really simple. And your accountant will love you for doing this. <laughs> do you have a separate account for each property or do you have one account for all your rental? Let's say you have three rental properties. Well, I think you have two things that you're thinking of, right? You have a bank account, that's important. And I like to, personally, I like to group them and the investors that I work with group them. So for example, they'll say, these properties I want to have coming into this checking account. Okay, no problem. But that doesn't mean they don't get a separate P&L, a profit and loss statement per property. That's still important. And we're talking about a, a checking account, kind of an operating account that you use to manage the property. But then you have a, an actual profit and loss statement where you could look at that property. Am I profitable on this property or am I losing money? And that you should be doing with all of your properties and you should be doing with each individual property. Because if you do that, you're, you're gonna be able to look at um, the, the health of that particular home and that particular investment. And if you just group everything together, you don't know which one's bringing it up and which one's dragging you down. So have a separate P&L per property. It'll be easy. And by the way, when you have uh, some rental properties, if you have like a VRBO or Airbnb, you might be getting three, four, five rental checks per month. Mm -hmm. On long-term rentals, single family, commercial property, it might just be over the course of a year, 12 rental checks. So it's, we're not talking about a lot of activity on the account, generally speaking. But we are talking about being able to review and see the health of your account and that property. And Danielle, we were talking before uh, we jumped on this call and we were saying that you also have rental properties. You have a VRBO. What tips mm -hmm. do you have as an owner of a rental property? So I, you know, everything that, that Rick has said, I subscribe to. So, you know, you have into it from a business mindset. Um, so it's not, oh, this has the cutest floors or this has, you know, this or this. Um, for me, I looked at the location. Um, so where was the location? Um, my uh, vacation rental is in Palm Springs. So how close was it to downtown? Um, where was it in proximity? Um, because it's in the desert. Did it have a swimming pool? Um, did it have a low maintenance yard? So those were the things that I looked at were what was, you know, the overall um, aesthetic and who would I attract? Um, then I, I kind of figured, okay, who's my target audience? Where am I going to, for this market, where am I going to get the most rentals? 
Um, so for me, um, and f well, for us, me, myself, and my husband, we um, essentially looked at a five bedroom house. So we decided that ours was going to be, um, we noticed that there was a shortage of five bedrooms uh, in the desert that we're actually renting. So we thought, gosh, wouldn't this be a great experience if the whole family could come together and stay in one location? Um, so that was one of the, some of the things that we looked at that we figured that um, what was going to give us that, you know, that rent, uh, rent to own ratio that we were looking for, that what was going to cover our expenses, et cetera. Um, that was really important to us. So that was our starting point. And it doesn't get much more extreme than these current situations of sheltering in place in COVID. How has this impacted your rental business? So for, um, for us in Palm Springs, it's been really interesting because obviously um, all in the desert, um, the uh, most book months are basically October through April. So for us historically, um, that's when you want to go. It's a little bit cooler. Uh, that's when the exciting stuff happens in the desert, Coachella, the festivals, Modernism Week, all the different things that are going on. Um, obviously, a lot of those months were truncated by COVID. So from March to June 19th, uh, we couldn't have any rentals. So we had to cancel all of our existing guests. Now, what's been interesting is we've been booked since June 19th in Riverside County when they opened up rentals. We have been booked almost every single day. Um, so again, it's 117 degrees in the desert right now. So this is maybe historically where you may not think of going, but when you have a five bedroom house with a pool and your whole family can come and safely gather in one location, um, I think it makes a difference. So we've had, um, we've been completely booked. But what's also been interesting is we have no longer term rentals. So we're completely booked up until pretty much the end of September. And then now we're just starting to get our October rentals. We're not seeing anyone book more than 60 days in advance because no one understands what's coming around the corner from COVID. So again, although we're getting getting into what we call season in the desert, we don't have our rentals booked out yet because it's all the short-term rentals. So that's what we've experienced. That's so interesting. Have you seen the same thing, Rick, with yours? Well, we absolutely have. Matter of fact, um, what's interesting about what Danielle had said is that we started in a market that the assumption with vacation rentals is you rent it over the weekend. It's not Friday, Saturday, Sunday thing. That's the assumption. Um, and what's happened with COVID is once they begin to lift those restrictions, especially we're talking about California properties. People are like, I don't want to take a flight. I definitely don't want to be on a cruise ship. So let's get in the car. Um, and maybe they get a couple of family members that live in the home with them, you know, safe, and they all go and they spend time. And they're sheltering in place in some sense, but in a different home. Mm -hmm. And it's in their vacation property. And whether that's Palm Springs or along the Pacific Ocean or on some lake, but what we found is that the rental market really then um, was accelerated and it no longer is Friday through Monday. Now it is, it is every day of the week the property mm. is booked. And uh, so for those that are interested in investing in an Airbnb or a vacation rental, it's a great time to do that. And some of the restrictions that were on uh, restaurants and hotels and things, those restrictions were on rental properties. And now we begin to see some of those things lift and county, every county is a little bit different. We've seen a lot of those lift freeing that up. The one thing I'd tell you, I think Danielle brought up some great points. I hope people were taking notes as she was saying what she looks for in investing because I think she's absolutely right. And the one thing I wanted to add there is I think it's also important to look at your competition. You know, when we bought our vacation rental property, uh, that we rent out. And when we bought that property, uh, it looked like grandma's home. You know, it, it had everything on it. It was old carpet. It was old. Uh, the, the walls were old. The kitchen was old. The bathrooms were original. Everything was old. And when I looked at the competition, other properties that were also renting in that market for a vacation rental, they too were exactly the same. And it didn't seem like you were staying in a modern home. It seemed like you were staying with grandma. And that, by doing that, it really minimized the audience. As a matter of fact, only a few people were, were willing to, to kind of even step back in time and go to a home with shag carpet, right? <laughs> or or the, remember the lime green blinds, right? Like very few people were willing to do that. And so when we made it a modern home, 
meaning that it was with all modern day amenities and we made it to where it was kind of a one-stop shop where you could go there and it was in some sense all inclusive you could stay there you could play there you could eat there it was everything you could do everything there the view was there that everything was at the property it created an audience for us that didn't exist in the market at that time and i think that's important to note look at your competition by the way look at how they advertise it it's not just the condition look at how they advertise it i couldn't believe how many properties danielle when we're when they're advertised even today in the real estate market and they're advertised with with cell phone pictures it's <laughs> unbelievable and and the ones that bother me the most are when the agents take a picture and you know exactly what it is because they got that little dot that bright dot in the bathroom mirror that means that they were caught in the picture or they leave the toilet seat up oh my goodness i could pull my hair out every time i see that <laughs> and, and and here you have a maybe a million dollar home maybe a multi-million dollar home and you're taking a picture with your cell phone and there's no aerial drone photography there's no professional uh, photographer that goes through there's no matterport virtual tours uh there's none of that and these properties are sometimes situated in beautiful areas with either acreage or views or uh, views of the hillsides or mountains or oceans or lakes or the desert, whatever. And they got beautiful views. And the only picture you get is the front of the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you think, boy, we really, that, that agent missed it. And if the agent missed it with photography, because they just took the picture with their cell phone, if the agent missed it with photography, how many people never clicked on that photo or the second or third or fourth photo that now maybe describes the beautiful amenities of the home? And I'm gonna tell you that if you don't have a great front photo when you're advertising, whether it's an Airbnb, a VRBO, a rental property, or even selling a primary residence, if you don't have a great front photo, it does not allow people to unlock the other 40, 50, 60 photos and videos that you have. The front photo, is is the gatekeeper to all the others and so know what your market's doing know what your competition's doing and that means you got to kind of dig a little deeper that one's not surface you've got to dig in you got to look at what they're doing and is there an opportunity for you to do something different to do something better and i think in some sense it's very simple is there a need to be met in the community is there a need to be met in the market and if you can find the need then fill it and it's that simple if there's a need for local vacation homes and local Airbnb or VRBO or home away, or there's a need for long-term rentals where people could live there for a year or two or more. If there's a need for commercial properties, like you find the need and it's as simple as providing a solution for it. And if you do that, you win. That's so smart. I think we need to do a separate podcast on just how to market your rental property. Oh, That's it's brilliant. so terrible. Yes. You and we'll do brilliant ideas. And if my stomach will bear it, we'll do before and after. So we'll show the picture <laughs> with the agent in the bathroom taking the picture <laughs> and you can see him taking the picture you know, from the from the bathroom mirror or leaving the toilet seat up or the shower doors open or the hand towel all watered up. You know, to most people, they don't, even, they don't even think about it. But to somebody that's never seen your property, they'll pick it up. And they may even pick it up subconsciously. Like, I don't know, there's something wrong with that property. Well, what's wrong with it is it was shot on a Samsung. That's what's wrong with it. <laughs> well, if you don't pay attention to detail and the little things, you know, who's to say you're not paying attention to the big things? So. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Danielle, if our audience has questions or would like to contact you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Sure, absolutely. So um, any questions about anything related to financing, uh, investment property or otherwise, uh, my cell phone number is 415-676-8460. Again, that's 415-676-8460. Or you can email me, Danielle. D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E -L -L -E dot Hollick, P-O-L-L-A-C-K at SupremeLending.com. Awesome. Thank you. So for those who are listening, you can write it down. And I, those who are watching on YouTube, I'll put that at the end of this video. So that's all the time we have for today. 
please join our Facebook group, Agents Thrive or Investors Thrive, to stay updated on the latest information in the market. And be sure to subscribe to the Rick Fuller Podcast. Thank you, Rick and Danielle. I appreciate your insight. It was so valuable. Um, Join us next week as we discuss feeling stuck, three ways to jumpstart your real estate business with Rick Fuller team member, Linda Tambury. Thanks for spending part of your day with us. And remember what Rick always says, not owning real estate is hazardous to your wealth. Thank you, you guys. (laughs) Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.